gotten in many national headlines in the wake of its data privacy scandal, which led to congressional hearings. And there have also been a few tweets here and there about a little company named Amazon. And in the midst of all of this, there's been a lot of talk and debate about whether these tech platforms have become too big and too powerful in the proper role of antitrust and, and dealing with some of these concerns. And uh, Macon Delrahim, the antitrust, antitrust chief at the U.S. Department of Justice, recently weighed in with a major speech on antitrust in the digital age during a conference at the University of Chicago. And we'll be touching on that speech during our discussion today. Here to help us get a handle on all of this are leading experts from the antitrust community. And before we jump into our discussion, I'd like to introduce the panel to you. Diana Moss is president of the American Antitrust Institute, immediately to my left here. And uh, that's a competition advocacy group here in Washington. Prior to joining AI, she served at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, where she coordinated the agency's competition analysis for electricity mergers. From 1989 to 1994, she consulted in private practice in the areas of regulation and antitrust. Uh, the, uh, as uh, Tim said, uh, we were originally going to have Josh Wright here, former FTC commissioner, but instead, uh, Jan Ribnicek has graciously stepped in at the last minute, and uh, he is senior associate of the Antitrust C uh, Competition and Trade Group in the Washington, D.C. office of the law firm Freshfield uh, Brockhouse Derringer. He represents clients on a range of antitrust issues relating to the U.S. merger control and review process, multi-jurisdictional merger control, joint ventures, civil antitrust litigation, and investigations before the uh, antitrust agencies. Prior to rejoining Freshfields in, in 2015, Jan served as an attorney advisor to Josh Wright, advising him on a range of competition and consumer protection issues. Uh, and we also have here uh, John Bergemeyer, who is a uh, senior counsel at Public Knowledge, specializing in telecommunications, media, internet, and intellectual property issues. He advocates for the public interest before courts and policymakers and works to make sure that all stakeholders, including ordinary citizens, artists, and technological innovators, have a say in shaping emerging digital policies. So let's dive in. Uh, as I said earlier, there have been growing concerns about the dominance of tech platforms like Facebook, Google, and Amazon. And these concerns have been bipartisan. At one of the recent Facebook hearings, one Republican senator, senator wondered if Facebook is a monopoly. Uh, Macon Delrahim said in his recent speech at the University of Chicago that antitrust enforcers should encourage, quote, fresh thinking on how current antitrust legal tools apply to new digital pr platforms, and he called for a civil discourse on the topic. In addition, the Federal Trade Commission now has a whole new slate of commissioners who have pledged to hold tech giants accountable to the antitrust laws, and they were all just confirmed just yesterday by the Senate. So my first question for the panel is, what does all this mean for tech and antitrust? Are we seeing a possible shift here in the regulatory environment? Anyone can jump in. Here we go. Thanks, Alexi, and uh, thanks to the caucus for inviting AAI here today. It's an honor and a pleasure to uh, be with you all. Um, I think. Uh, that's a big question. <laughs> we could really unpack that for a few hours, but I, just, just by way of making a few major points, um, I think the digital markets raise, um, r raise a whole cadre of very multifaceted issues. And because of that, uh, they also potentially raise a lot of questions about what are the right policy tools to address concerns about competition in the digital markets or, or the platforms. So when I mean policy tools, uh, certainly antitrust enforcement is one uh, on the competition side, but we also have issues arising, obviously, with privacy, with the Facebook uh, incident. Uh, intellectual property is a big issue involving digital markets. Um, technology policy. So, so we're really talking about a whole suite of policy tools that could be brought to bear to, to address some of the issues and concerns with the digital, um, the digital markets. I think it's important to realize that um, we need to choose the appropriate combination of policy tools to address these issues. Uh, and I, there, antitrust is absolutely in the spotlight. Concerns about large, large uh, large digital players, concerns about privacy have sort of 
you know, we've had a perfect storm where these have melded together. So I think there is a, a um, an intense focus on the role of antitrust in these particular markets. But I, I think we need to ask some basic questions about what part of these, these issues we're concerned about are addressable by antitrust as a policy tool? And I say that because we don't want to load up antitrust with, with, with tasks and functions and goals for which it is not designed. And, and that is to promote competition and to protect consumers. And so we have to ask, how do we apply the antitrust frame to the digital markets? And the first step in that, of course, is to figure out what is the, what is the problem that we're worried about? What is the competition issue? Antitrust very much works through a methodical process of determining what is a competitive problem and then goes back to look at markets and define those markets to clarify and articulate what uh, the competitors are potentially being harmed. AAI's view is that the antitrust laws absolutely can apply to the digital markets. They're more complex. They're ecosystems of connectivity and value-added services. Obviously, that's very different than if you're dealing with railroads or telecommunications. So we're we're talking about you know different business models. We're talking about. Um, different types of services that are delivered to consumers like social connectivity uh, and other types of functionality. Um, but we should not assume from the outset that these digital platforms uh, don't necessarily compete with one another and they exist in these isolated silos. We need to ask the antitrust questions. Do they compete? And if so, how do they compete? Do they compete in delivering connectivity and information? Uh, and, and go on to ask questions like, well, how are consumers transacting? And, you know, they're not transacting through prices. They're transacting through giving their information and their attention to the platforms, the digital markets players, uh, who then create value, a very much a value proposition, and, and then we go from there. So these are fundamental questions that need to be asked. What is the competitive concern? What markets are we dealing with? And then if we get to the point where antitrust really, there is a role for antitrust there, which I believe there is, we need to talk about potential remedies. So antitrust laws apply within the existing frame, the consumer welfare standard, which I'm sure you've all heard about is important. It can reach to price effects, to quality effects, to innovation effects. Uh, and certainly the laws are flexible and durable enough to, to, to take on these challenges. But there are some really specific questions we need to ask before we jump to the conclusion that antitrust should be taking care of every concern and, and issue that are raised by digital market players. So uh, I think I agree with a lot, if not most of that. And I think, um, you know, if Diana look at it, Diana and I look at any particular deal, we might disagree on how, what the outcome of that deal might be. But I think uh, broadly there's a consensus across uh, the political spectrum about uh, what the role of the antitrust law should be, how they should be implemented, what the things are that we should be looking at uh, to, to, to reach our conclusions. Um, what's happening right now is kind of, uh, you're seeing the populism, which is kind of pervasive in, in kind of modern society right now, get into antitrust, and that's uh, dovetailing with uh, the large uh, internet tech giants as an easy target. And um, you're hearing calls to abandon the way to do antitrust that we've been doing for you know, 30 plus years, 40 plus years, um, in, in order to provide agencies with more discretion, to provide courts with more discretion, to use the antitrust uh, laws to target uh, these companies. Um, the problem is, is that we've been down this path before. This is, you know, I appreciate uh, Del Rahim's um, call for fresh thinking, and I think, you know, a benefit of the antitrust laws as we have them is the ability to update both in terms of economics and the facts. But some of the new ideas, quote, quote unquote, new ideas, aren't actually new ideas. These are ideas that came from the first half of the 20th century, right? Uh, their approach to thinking about markets just in terms of how many competitors there are um, and what their shares are rather than their actual competitive dynamics and looking and asking the tough questions that Diana outlined, you know, how do, how do the parties inter interact? Um, and, and thankfully, as a result of kind of an economics revolution that started in the 70s, um, we've been able to implement the antitrust laws more accurately so as to actually target that conduct 
that is likely to harm consumers while letting the other conduct go through. I mean, that's obviously uh, one, of the, one of the trickiest aspects of the antitrust laws is there's a lot of conduct that, and most conduct, is beneficial. Now, you can look at cartel conduct, and that's always bad, or you know, in the instances where it's not that bad, the, the, the cost of, of punishing those um, is not outweighed by kind of easy administrable rules. So we apply a per se rule, all cartels are bad, and, and that makes sense. But in, in the vast majority of other conduct, whether it's mergers or uh, pri you know, or pricing decisions, um, we have to be careful not to condemn behavior that's actually good for consumers, good for the world. Um, and I think some of the uh, recent populism and, and turns to antitrust past is, is forgetting the lessons that we've learned uh, in the last 40 years um, through the advances in modern economics. Uh, but these issues are important, obviously, whether it's uh, social issues like wealth inequality and uh, uh, you know, corporate profits or, or political power, those are important issues and they're obviously discussed uh, in this building and other buildings on the Hill. Um, but whether or not that's something that the antitrust law should be doing, in my opinion, is it, it's not because uh, we don't have the tools uh, to identify where those problems are occurring as a result of conduct or mergers or what have you. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll leave it there and let. So <clears throat> I have a few points. One, you know, the, the challenge of applying, I think, antitrust to digital markets, there's a lot. Uh, one of them is just the complexities. I think Diana mentioned this a little bit, but these tech platforms, they're not just offering products in a marketplace to consumers. In fact, oftentimes the products that they're offering are free. And, you know, how does antitrust deal with that? Uh, it's complicated because when you look at, like, some, take Google Search, for instance, you know, they're offering a search engine to consumers charging nothing. Well, who else is involved in that transaction? Well, all the content out there on the internet, right? So you might say that, you know, a particular user can switch away from Google, but if I'm a website and I depend on 90% uh, for 90% of my traffic on incoming references from Google, like I'm just stuck. If Google starts behaving in a way that harms me, I can't just switch, you know, I can't switch away from a source of incoming traffic. And I think you have to look at both sides of that market when you're analyzing antitrust, and that can be very hard because the dynamics change. And in fact, you know, just to make it even more complicated, there's advertisers too. So with Google search, you really have a three-sided market of advertisers, content producers, and consumers. I think ultimately if there are harms to advertisers, if there are harms to content producers, ultimately consumers do bear those costs. I think consume, anytime you see competitive harms happening in the marketplace, you know, it somehow trickles down to consumers. But just tracing out exactly how that happens is way more complicated in a product like that than with, you know, uh, you know four car manufacturers merge into three. I think that's a much easier uh, case. I think the other reason why it is hard to, uh, you know, analyze these issues uh, has just been just the rate of technological change. Um, that is often used as uh, a reason why we should not apply antitrust laws uh, too strictly to tech markets, the theory being that they're constantly evolving, there's new technologies, new competitors coming about. Uh, I would just want to push back on this one talking point I hear in that regard. Uh, pretty much all the time, which is that, oh, you know, you had MySpace and they were so dominant, but it turned out not to be a big deal. Then Facebook came along and then, you know, people are worried about Facebook and then the next Facebook's going to come along. Well, you know, Facebook didn't come along at first by taking away MySpace customers. It's just that the, the universe of broadband subscribers was increasing so rapidly globally that they just took away all the new growth. And in fact, at first, Facebook didn't shrink. It's just that, I mean, excuse me, MySpace didn't shrink. It's just that Facebook grew faster. And you see the same story again and again with tech. It's not like uh, IBM was dethroned by Microsoft. It's just Microsoft came along and had a much bigger market than Microsoft ever had. IBM stayed huge, and they're still huge. Uh, when you look at mobile, mobile did that to PCs. Um, you know, Apple alone sells more iOS devices than the entire universe of Windows PCs. Mobile is just a vastly larger market than PCs were. Microsoft is still super dominant in PCs. So you have to ask, okay, you know, is there going to be some market that is even bigger and bigger and bigger that comes along and just sort of relegates each market? And I think we might be reaching a point where that's not going to happen when you have a social network that is, you know, has billions of users and when you have smartphones where essentially 
almost everyone on earth who can afford one has one, you're reaching a point where I don't think you can just assume that there's gonna be some new revolution that comes along and creates a market that is so much bigger than the markets that have existed before because we're actually reaching a saturation point with a lot of these technologies where it's gonna be a lot more of a zero sum game, I think, between competitors. I'm not saying a new social network won't come along, but it'll be a much different market dynamic because they're not gonna come along by just grabbing all of the new internet users necessarily. Um, <clears throat> If anything I say sounds like I'm critical of, of antitrust, you know, I, I, I entirely agree with, uh, you know, with what Diana opened with, which is there's a lot of other tools that should be used to pursue these public interest goals. And I'm a huge and strong advocate of using those other tools to their fullest extent. Um, and I think this is why you start to see a little bit of a change. You know, some people, I think they're characterized as calling for antitrust to solve every problem. They recognize that you know some businesses by the by their nature just going to be big, and you just have to maybe regulate them. Uh, I think you you hear a lot of people talking about anti-monopoly as opposed to necessarily antitrust, and I believe that difference in terminology indicates that they recognize that there's a whole basket of tools. There's legislation. There's regulatory commissions. There's tax policy. You know, there's any number of things that you know should be addressed if you're concerned about tech giants. And I and I would agree that antitrust isn't necessarily the only tool. Uh, my biggest criticism of, uh, of antitrust and, you know, the consumer welfare standard as applied is just that it doesn't live up to its own stated goals all the time. Uh, there is a focus on measurable you're in an adversarial court proceeding very often, you need to convince someone, you know, you're necessarily going to gravitate towards those sorts of really quantifiable effects. But I think, uh, you know, although Theoretically and on paper and according to the academics who study these things, you know, consumer welfare includes harms to innovation. Well, harms to innovation are a lot harder to measure. And I think as a result in the actual enforcement, innovation harms sometimes get a free pass just because they're, they're very speculative, they're necessarily predictive, there's really no way to prove them one way or the other. Uh, and I think that is a serious shortcoming uh, in, in how people approach antitrust. Uh, and, you know, the other respect would just be ignoring certain markets by focusing on particular markets. So when you're looking at a two-sided market, just looking at one side or sort of ignoring effects on labor markets, I think those are all shortcomings. And they're shortcomings, I'm not saying, you know, wholesale replace all of antitrust doctrine with a new doctrine, but, you know, make it live up to its stated goals of promoting consumer welfare. Um, and that is, those are my opening statements. So, uh, so John, did you have any specific thoughts about what needs to be done and if either of the other panelists want to respond after that? I, I think it depends on, you know, what needs to be done uh, in, in what regard. I think, you know, we do need to have some sort of new framework in terms of privacy. I don't want to get over my skis in saying necessarily what it is, but I think uh, it's pretty clear that there's a, a pretty big gap in how privacy enforcement works in the United States and how businesses uh, interact with and collect and share user data in ways that are just totally invisible to users, and there's very few uh, legal safeguards. Uh, whether that is an antitrust problem is an interesting question. I think certainly if you have a single social network that is super dominant and then it is reckless with people's privacy and then everyone's privacy is harmed all at the same time and that's very bad. Uh, you know, but if you had a more competitive market with 10, 15 social networks, uh, each one of those still could harm user privacy. So I think you need to have a framework that addresses, you know, not just the concentration harms, but also just the basic behavior. Uh, I, I look at privacy regulation as more akin to like, uh, you know, pollution regulation where it is just a, a negative externality in the marketplace that we solve uh, through various tools, just including prohibiting the behavior and it's not necessarily tied to how big you are. Anyone want to respond? I'll say, I'll say a couple of things on this. I think all these points that have been raised are really, really excellent and they're, they're really part of a, of a, an intelligent discussion about about these issues. So I, I would add that you know to determine the role, proper role of antitrust. You know we have to go back to first principles. Uh, we can't wave our hands and say, oh, we we think the platforms are too big, um, and and so it must be antitrust's problem to solve. That that's not the way antitrust works. We need to have, uh, or we need to articulate what we think 
uh, the harms are, either harm to competitors or harm to, harm to competition or harm to consumers. And so is it a pricing problem, right? Are prices too high coming out of digital, uh, digital platform players and markets? Are prices too low, for example, if, they're, if there are concerns about predatory pricing? Um, are we seeing a lower quality of an experience on, on the platforms? And this would be the privacy issue, right? Consumers, uh, users don't, uh, are giving information uh, and the information is not being um, kept kept secure. Uh, the platforms are not are not good stewards, for example, of keeping uh, data safe. Um, or are we seeing edge providers squeezed out because platforms are large and they are using their market power to eliminate them through mergers, for example, or through uh, constraints on interoperating with the with the platforms? Um, I think the issue of privacy deserves just a. a, a a really hard look, a really hard look. Because, again, the, the antitrust issues around the platforms and the privacy issues around the platforms have met up in this perfect storm, and it's driving um, public policy towards antitrust as a solution. And I would really encourage a, a huge step backward to address where the privacy problem is really best addressed. What is the most efficient and appropriate policy tool? For example, um, I mean, is maybe privacy is a market failure, where markets just aren't getting it right and they're not allocating resources. Maybe it's a problem of asymmetric information. In other words, consumers have much less information about how their data is being used than what the platforms are doing with their data. And by the way, it's not just the raw data, it's how the data is processed, how value is added to the data, and how data is used by the platforms to create interlinked sets of services, whether it's calendaring or scheduling or mapping or restaurant recommendations or advertising. So maybe it's an asymmetric asymmetric information problem. If that's the case, then that would, would, would be a candidate for economic regulation, economic regulation. M maybe privacy issues are more of a social regulation problem. You know, we, we, we have OSHA regulations to protect the safety and the health and the well-being of workers and consumers. Maybe privacy ri rises to the level of being all about consumer and citizen well-being. If that's the case, then social regulation would be um, a possible tool. So, so, so that's two other policy tools that we might think about to address privacy issues. Then the question is, well, is, is, is antitrust um, the best tool to deal with privacy? And I would actually argue that it is not. Um, and, and, the, and the way you get to that conclusion is that if, if privacy is a problem for antitrust, it's got to be a quality problem. It's got to be firms who possess market power having fewer incentives to compete hard with each other on keeping consumer data safe, right? So, and you might get to that through, say, a merger. Say you have a merger of, of two more of, uh, involving players that control huge caches of data or ability to process data through machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that sort of thing. Maybe if they're so big, they have fewer incentives to compete hard to keep that data safe. That could potentially be an antitrust problem. We haven't seen it yet, but this goes back to the basic question of whether enforcers are going to be willing to ask these hard questions moving forward. Um, but there are all sorts of other problems with privacy as an antitrust problem. For example, we see small market players not keeping data safe. We see a lot of digital players that have arguably zero market power or very little market power who have been the subject of data breaches and who do not have good uh, data protection policies. So answer that question, right? We don't even know if competitive markets create incentives to keep data safe and to promote privacy, right? And because, because firms may not be able to do that, there may be indirect costs that they're not willing to absorb as, as a result of that. So I think we have to ask those really hard questions and figure out, is, Anna, is, it a, is it a market power problem? Is it an antitrust problem? Is it a problem for social regulation because we care about well-being, the well-being of citizens? Or is it more of an economic uh, market failure problem and are, is a different type of oversight? I think bottom line, we need a basic level of privacy in this country. And the US is terrible on privacy. We all know that. Look what's going on in Europe, right? The Europeans are all over this, and, and we're not. <laughs> and so the US should get on it. And we should uh, create a, you know, a, 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 a level of support for basic privacy protections. 
And, and that will come through the legislative process. And then, after that, we can start addressing questions related to enhanced level of privacy. Because frankly, there are lots of consumers who don't care as much about their privacy as other consumers do, right? I come from a generation where we coveted our privacy, and I still do. I don't understand why my kids are you know, on Facebook and putting stuff out on Instagram and all this other stuff. So, so we're going to have to deal with that after we get to the basic level of privacy, most likely through legislative efforts, we're going to have to deal with those dif differences in how consumers value it. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the value of, of data that we're seeing, particularly with the recent revelations about Facebook uh, transferring uh, data to an analytics company that helped elect the president. Uh, is data the, the big oil, the, the, the oil of the, the, uh, the digital era? And if so, is there a challenge that uh, antitrust regulators have in dealing uh, uh, in addressing this issue? Are, are they equipped for it? So uh, I want to comment on some of the comments that have been made as well. But uh, is, is data oil? Um, no. I mean, when you drill into the ground, you get oil, and that oil is no longer there. Data, uh, you can give your data to Facebook, you can give it to Google. It's not, uh, it's not unique to one source, right? So I, I think in that way, it's, it, it's not like oil. Um, but I think Diana laid out kind of the right way to think about these things from an antitrust perspective is, you know, does a, does a transaction, for example, uh, the combination of two firms somehow give them uh, newfound market power or leverage to use their data in some sort of uh, way that hurts the competitive process, that hurts consumers, ultimately? Um, now, sure, I think we could probably think of theories, whether or not those happen in real life, I, I don't know. Um, there's also obviously benefits to having data, right? The more data you have, um, especially in kind of these network effect circumstances, the better you can utilize it. Um, obviously, um, when Uber started, Uber didn't have a lot of data, but as they gained more and more data, they were able to become more and more competitive against the regular taxis. Um, so, so data, uh, aggregating data and gaining data obviously has a lot of benefits as well. So I think, you know, uh, and maybe I'll just be this side, that this, this person in, on, this, uh, on this panel is just, you always got to think about the other side with privacy as well, right? Um, I was born in Europe. I love Europe. I just spent six months living in Brussels. Um, but every time you log on to, to, to a browser, you get 16 notifications about your privacy uh, alerts and whether or not you opt in or opt out and just letting you know that you know, your information may or may not be shared, there are cookies and there aren't cookies, things like that. So those have transaction costs and some people will grow annoyed by them depending on how, much, uh, how, how many notifications there are um, to tell you your privacy rights or not. So I think you do have to think about um, what a regulatory um, system on top of um, you know, how we think about privacy looks like at the end of the day. Um, and some people, you know, care less about their privacy than others, right? I mean, and would prefer the free thing. Um, do I care if Google knows where I am, uh, my birthday, things like that? Um, uh, or would I rather pay for Gmail, you know, however many dollars a month? Uh, I probably don't want to pay for Gmail. So I, I think those are, those are the issues to be obviously thinking about. In terms of the consumer welfare standard, um, you know, I, I think uh, it does so much more than uh, a lot of the, the critics think it does. I mean, innovation is, is, in the, is well captured by the consumer welfare standard, and when people criticize whether the consumer welfare standard doesn't pick up innovation is because, uh, uh, because enforcers don't actually prosecute that case. Well, the fact that the enforcer didn't prosecute that case doesn't mean that consumer welfare isn't doing the work it's supposed to be doing. It means that hey, we don't have enough evidence to know whether or not we should be prosecuting, right? I mean, uh, merger enforcement uh, necessarily is uh, predictive, future-looking. You're trying to predict what's going to happen after the transaction. Sometimes you have the inputs. Sometimes you know what the party's incentives are, what their plans are for product development. Sufficient to say, aha, if they combine, one of these products is going to die, for example, or they'll be able to kill some other products. Uh, sometimes you don't, and that's not necessarily a bug. That's a feature. Uh, in the consumer welfare standard. It tells you to stop, let's not intervene because we don't have enough information. Um, and, and that's the way the antitrust laws have been developed over the last 50, 40 to 50 years is with an understanding that um, there are instances in which we shouldn't intervene because we don't know if we're, we're um, 
harming consumers more than helping. For example, with predatory pricing, it's, it's pretty difficult to bring a predatory pricing case, and that's for good reason, right? Because price competition is important. I want uh, competitors to be lowering their price in reaction to each other. Now, there is some set of stylized facts in which uh, you know, pr predatory pricing can be used to enhance or uh, to perpetuate a monopoly. But proving that is hard, and that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I think that the, the fact that there's a, a burden of proof with bringing antitrust cases is really a result of the fact that it's an adversarial process. You're in court. You're trying to meet your civil burden of proof. Uh, so I, I think the, the looking at a law enforcement type process like that to be, you know, essentially the only form of consumer protection, you know, that's why I think it, it should not be. Uh, I agree, you know, it might be hard to convince a judge or a jury of your innovation-based harms when your innovation-based harms are based on like, you know, I'm an expert in the industry, I'm looking at how things are going, I'm just kind of predicting how I think things are going to be. You know, it's like, you know, does that necessarily rise to the level of evidence that you need to find someone like civilly liable, uh, in fact, criminally liable for, for violating some set of laws? And, you know, maybe not. But that's the kind of thing that regulatory agencies do all the time. And, you know, a lot there's a lot of critics of that. Uh, but the reason, I think there's a reason for having those agencies who are able to make predictive judgments and when their expertise is deferred to, because I think we recognize that there are some kinds of harm uh, that really are hard to pin down with maybe the level of specificity you might need in a court of law, yet they're nevertheless real. They might even be likely, even if you can't describe exactly how they work, and I think that is partly why you have uh, these other sorts of uh, government entities uh, that pursue those sorts of goals. Um, on the data point, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to make it sound like I said that there is no competitive dimension to data because there obviously is. I think if you have a huge hoard of data, uh, that is a competitive advantage that you have over potential rivals. Uh, it's one that allows you to offer a better product, which causes more consumers to use you, which means you have more data, and it sort of snowballs. And I think that can be a significant barrier to entry with a lot of, uh, you know, with a lot of tech platforms. Uh, and I think one of the interesting dimensions, which I always sort of go back to with the, uh, the recent uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal, is that uh, I think it shows that these companies that have a lot of data don't necessarily always act in their own best interest. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, you, know, you often hear it said that these companies, it's the, if data is what makes is their competitive advantage, if it, if it differentiates them from their competitors, that they have this vast trove of data which they can use internally then to provide you know, targeted advertising, uh, why would you ever give it away? Why would you give it to third parties? Like you're giving away the keys to the kingdom. Uh, and I think with Facebook, they kind of realized that they were probably doing the wrong thing when they reversed their policies, but for a while, they just were giving it away. You know, Facebook says, oh, we weren't selling your data. It's like, yeah, you were trading it. <laughs> you were giving it away to third parties. Third parties ended up with it when previously they did not have it. You know, focusing on the semantics of whether they sell it seems a little bit besides the point. They're really locking down more uh, because I think it was basically an error on their part why would you do that? And it harms consumers uh, as well for, you know, uh, that, so when you're looking at these issues, you can't just always assume that companies are going to do what's right, uh, even in their own self-interest, because, you know, they get distracted by other things. In Facebook's case, it was, you know, trying to get developers to use their application platform, which they don't really make any money on. They make money off ads, but nevertheless, they were willing to basically, without realizing it, undermine their own ad business uh, in order to promote this, you know, this other uh, trend du jour. I think that's pretty fascinating. And uh, I'll just make one comment on the GDPR framework, because I think we're going to all be watching that this is the European privacy regulation, uh, which is coming into effect in, uh, on May 25th, and people who don't follow this, I'm sure everyone in this room does, may have noticed that you're getting all kinds of terms of service updates from like every last uh, internet service, and that's because they're all updating their policies to attempt at least to be GDPR compliant. Uh, I think it's going to be fascinating because there's some aspects of GDPR which I think uh, a lot of the tech companies really don't like. 
Uh, I mean, not only can you say no, not only can you revoke your consent, so once they have your data and you give it to them, you can make them go back and delete it uh, and show them what data you have. I think those by themselves are some pretty powerful tools. Uh, in a lot of cases, if they ask you for your data and then you say no, they still have to let you use the service. They just don't get to collect your data. So they're not allowed to just have like terms of service that you have to agree to in order to use the product. In many cases, uh, they can ask you for your data and you can say no and then you still get the product. And I think that is an interesting uh, experiment, you know, uh, you know, fans of the GDPR may wish that we had it here already. Critics might assume that it's just, everything is going to go up in flames and it's not going to work over in Europe. Uh, but one way or the other, we have the benefit, I think, of a natural experiment uh, between, you know, a very aggressive privacy framework uh, going into effect uh, in Europe and not going into effect here and just seeing how effective it's going to be. So, so, John, you mentioned that uh, data can be a competition issue. Do you think that's gotten enough attention in merger enforcement? And, and are there any deals that have gotten through that you, you, you think where you think data was an issue uh, that uh, maybe was a missed opportunity? I think it is a version of the problem with a lot of tech platforms, which is that they have network effects. I think data. Uh, collection is basically a form of network effect because the, the more users you have, the more data you have, the better your product gets. And that's very similar to you know the classic network effect. The more people are using your communications network, the more valuable it is, so more people use it. Uh, and as a result, I think in these markets that have data, uh, as well as you know the other kinds of network effects we see in platform in, in platforms such as the classic one or the applications network effect, things like that. Uh, I, I think there isn't necessarily enough attention paid to the fact that, you know, maybe these markets just inevitably are going to be concentrated. Uh, and instead of just saying, well, that's bad, we don't like concentration, it's like, yeah, we should get competition wherever we can, but if there are some markets which naturally tend towards natural monopoly, we need to just deal with that and stop ignoring it or pretending that you know something new is going to come along because it might not. Uh, in this other area that I work on, net neutrality, we've been arguing about net neutrality and really related issues for decades upon decades. Uh, and you don't see very much new entry in uh, last mile ISP networks. You know, we can have all kinds of arguments about what the right policy response is, but I think you see those markets and to just hope that there's going to be new competition just around the corner, I think just ignores history. You know, we have the same cable companies, the same telecom companies, changing name, changing owners, but it's essentially the same people who laid down the wires to begin with. Maybe wireless will shake things up, but I think hoping for that, uh, you know, year after year is isn't necessarily the best policy. And if we have the same dynamic online where we're going to have a number of just, you know, a dominant search engine, which appears that, you know, it appears that we do, uh, a dominant social network, you know, I think we need to think about, okay, it would be great to have competition in those markets. And let's see, what, let's do everything we can to have competition in those markets. But also, plan B, if those markets are inevitably always going to be very highly concentrated, do we need to start having some kind of rules of the road for what these companies can and can't do to protect the kinds of consumer harms that you know, t typically go alongside monopoly? Diane? So just a couple of follow-ups. These, these are all great thoughts, but, but I think there's some really important distinction, this is on, uh, distinctions to make. Um, there's a huge distinction to be made between the raw data that consumers input into, into the platforms, what you put on your Facebook page, what you post on Instagram, uh, what you say on Twitter. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's raw data. And, and there's a huge difference between the raw data and, and how the digital market players are able to process that data, right? There's an incredible amount of data processing that, that goes on. And the purpose of processing the data is to create value propositions for the platforms, whether it's advertising or connectivity or uh, linking to other services like calendars and maps. We talked about that just a minute ago. Those are very different things for antitrust. Those are, that's different functionality. Uh, those products, if you can define them as separate products, have different, um, have very, very different implications. And I think where antitrust comes in um, is not a, in the raw data. And I'm an economist and, and have done, you know, oodles of data work in my career. And data is very, very messy. And data in a very raw form can be almost valueless. It's how the data gets processed. And the functionality and the capability that the mar digital market players are, are, are controlling um, uh, or acquiring 
uh, as opposed to developing through organic growth, to, to create some market power around data processing. So I think antitrust will have to grapple with that issue. That's a good issue for antitrust, particularly going back to the example of if you have a merger between two companies that control significant data processing, uh, artificial intelligence type of capabilities. So that, that absolutely could potentially be reachable. Because the concern might be in a merger case that they would, um, they would have significant market share in data processing and they could use that either to foreclose smaller rivals or to, uh, or, or to raise prices, for example, to advertisers or something like that. So we need to think about that. I do want to push back a little bit on this notion that, well, we know these markets are complex. We've already you've heard that from all three of us up here. But that doesn't, just because markets are complex and there are network effects, uh, and, and these are what we call zero price markets where consumers aren't handing over money, they're handing over eyeballs and they're handing over information and attention that they give. Just because of those complexities, uh, we cannot conclude that antitrust can't, cannot or should not reach to a genuinely uh, a genuine competition issue. And in fact, the antitrust enforcers, this goes back to your first question, should be, they should absolutely be getting educated on this stuff, right? We, we need to keep the, edu the agencies on the edge. We need to keep the education uh, going and flowing through any variety of advocacy channels and education channels, conferences and whatnot. But the argument that because this is a very murky, innovative, fast-moving, fast-paced sphere is not a good one to get good, strong competition policy and vigorous enforcement, right? Uh, AAI is a, is a progressive advocacy organization. We have been agitating for more vigorous enforcement for 20 years. And, and there is no exception here. So to, to suggest that antitrust enforcers should forbear from enforcing the laws because these are fast changing, innovative, high technology, can't figure it out industries, that's not a good reason. And it's not a good uh, motivation for getting strong and, and vigorous enforcement. We have a bunch of smart enforcers at the FTC and the DOJ. Uh, they have the capability to understand these markets and get up to speed on them. And yes, we would like to see cases brought that genuinely target competitive issues uh, in, in digital markets, should that be the appropriate policy tool, all right? That doesn't mean there aren't other policy tools to deal with privacy. I think as all three of us have agreed, privacy is probably not best addressed through the realm of antitrust, right? So, so um, you know, to get vigorous enforcement, we need to educate, we need to keep thinking about this, we need enforcers to take the appropriate steps when necessary if they spot competitive problems. I can just add, I think, I think I agree with that. And I would say, you know, where the debate is today uh, and where the education is getting smart on these things is, is that, you know, where do you draw the line? What evidence is enough? What kind of presumptions do you apply? What, what are the burdens of proof? You know, obviously you don't need complete certainty. And also you, you don't need just a mere possibility. So there's something in between in terms of what level of evidence you, you need. And that, I think that is a healthy debate and it's informed by our learning and the economics and everything. Uh, what I don't think is, is necessary is throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak. Um, you don't need to change the model completely and go away from consumer welfare because there's enormous cost associated with that. Well, I think that we can all agree on. So th this might be a good time to uh, turn to the audience and see if there are any questions. Start with that gentleman. Oh, do we do we have uh, any? Anybody? Sure, I, I'm happy to comment. I mean, I, I've, up until recently, I was following it closely, but got busy. Um, you know, I, I think I agree with a lot of things that uh, Macon Del Rahim has done and kind of some of the policies he's set. I don't know that this case is, is, falls in that bucket. I mean, if you watch how the case is developed, I think most people watching will think that the DOJ is on its, on its heels. Um, now, who knows how it'll turn out at the end of the day. I mean, we're, we've been surprised before. But I think the evidence that is kind of shook, 
from the very beginning, from the complaint that was issued up until now and seeing the trial and seeing the witnesses and the evidence presented, I think most antitrust watchers, and, and I use that advisedly, uh, would say that this is not going well for the DOJ and that the evidence hasn't really shown um, that there's gonna be harm to consumers, particularly, and I think what's interesting about this case is that, um, and this is a little wonky antitrust stuff, is that there's no presumption, typically in horizontal mergers that go above a certain threshold, there's a presumption of harm that attaches and then basically it's on the defendants to rebut the presumption. Here there's no presumption because it's a vertical case and there's no horizontal consolidation. Um, and so that means, you know, if you do get into a battle of experts and Carl Shapiro doesn't do as well as Carlton, uh, the tie probably goes to the parties. Uh, if you all can introduce yourself as, as well. Yeah, let me, let me try to tackle what you said. So I think it is undeniable that in the tech industry, you know, this phenomenon of aqua hires is very common, where, you know, companies are purchased for their personnel, for maybe for their technology. There's no interest in really keeping the product going. Uh, the question is, you know, when, when do acquisitions, like smaller acquisitions, let's say, not, you know, two reasonably comparable firms uh, merging or buying each other, but, the, you know, these smaller acquisitions, can those be competitively harmful? I think yes. I think in particular when the company that is being acquired is a potential rival in the future to the acquiring company, I think that's one area that we really do need to take a much harder look at you know, how enforcement has gone. When you see you know, Facebook buying Instagram and then WhatsApp, you know, maybe if you're looking for potential competitors, if you believe that there's always gonna be you know, a new Facebook around, okay, so let's allow them to develop and, you know, make sure that new social networks can develop and maybe, you know, we should, we should take a much stronger stance against, you know, one social network buying another social network and therefore amplifying uh, its, its, uh, its power. Uh, you know, maybe another example would be Google buying Waze, where Waze is this amazing popular uh, mapping product that was getting a lot of users and then, you know, the maker of the already most popular mapping product buys them, you know, thus eliminating any potential that there could be, you know, a, a serious cross-platform rival to Google Maps. So I think you do have instances where, uh, you know, the existing practice sometimes allows these smaller acquisitions to happen because they don't rise to, you know, whatever legal thresholds are established. But at the same time, I think when you look at them, you're like, hmm, you know, that actually, that one might have been a bad idea from a competitive, uh, from a competitive standpoint. And other kinds of deals, it just depends on, you know, is the technology that's being acquired being used by competitors or not? Uh, you know, vertical integration, you know, I have a different opinion on AT&T, I'll just point that out, I have a different opinion on, on the AT&T Time Warner uh, merger than, than uh, my co-panelist here, but you know, not all vertical integration, most vertical integration is not competitively harmful. You're just buying something because it's more efficient just to have it in-house given the nature of your business. So is a particular piece of vertical integration gonna be harmful? It just kinda, kinda is very fact specific. Can I add one important point to what you said? Because you raised a really good issue. I, I think if you look across all the areas of enforcement, uh, with the with the eye, eye to invigorating enforcement and encouraging strong enforcement in this area, merger control is going to be going to be the lead dog. 
right? So we are uh, encouraging the agencies, and we have seen cases. John just listed some of them. Same with Google ITA. That was years ago, but still highly relevant. Um, the the enfor enforcers are going to have to be really extra um, extra vigilant in looking at these transactions that scoop up small rivals on the edge. Uh, whether they be potential competitors, we have this potential competition doctrine, or whether they be existing competitors. Merger control is gonna be one of the most important uh, prongs of antitrust enforcement in, the, in these particular areas. You know, it's not just monopoly. It, there are three areas of antitrust enforcement, mergers, conspiracies, and, and monopolies. So, so I think this is an area where we're gonna, we're gonna um, look for activity. And, and it's also one area where the value of retrospective studies can be really helpful. We're encouraging the agencies to do, to do more look backs on you know what happened after Microsoft LinkedIn, what happened after after um, you know the acquisitions of Waze and Snapchat. So so those are good tools. If I can just add one thing, because gentlemen's questions, could we have a, a hard stop at one? <laughs> Good question. I am, I am not an expert on Section 230. I'm sure John could, could speak to this very articulately, but I will make the more general comment that um, uh, to, to horse together a, a good, comprehensive, coherent policy to deal with the, the issues we're talking about today, uh, there will absolutely be a need to go back and look for trapdoors and loopholes in, in, the, in the, the bigger fabric of the rules and the regulations and and the institutions we have for for dealing with competition and the and and related issues, and if it means getting you know revisiting immunities and exemptions, then that will that should be done. We just came off a DOJ roundtable a month ago talking all about immunities and exemptions and how they can really be harmful. Um, if it means revising rules and bringing them up to date, uh, then then those initiatives should be should be started and and. All of the people in this room are probably in a position to to introduce those types of ideas. So I would just say one one of the challenges in debating two thirties two thirties we don't know what the but for world would be today had we not passed two thirty. Part of the reason why two thirty was enacted was because the. Uh, the case law was moving in a very uh, basically bad direction, whereby if you were a platform that ignored what was happening on your platform, you were immune. But if you tried to go in and remove bad stuff, well, then you're a publisher or a speaker of the content, and therefore you're liable for everything that happens, which is exactly the wrong result. You wanted to encourage people to take down the bad stuff without that act of moderation creating liability. So Congress passed 230, which basically said, you're just not a speaker, and even if you do moderate, you're still not a speaker. Um, I don't think that any particular piece of legislation or law is, you know, sacred uh, or should never be rethought, but I think you just have to be careful uh, that you don't create uh, the bad incentive whereby you, you start to say, well, if you're a neutral platform, therefore you're immune, but if you do any moderation at all, then we're going to hold you liable because, again, that is, the, that is the bad result that leads to the perverse consequence of, you know, making, making more bad stuff happen, uh, essentially. Uh, so, you know, I think just a lot of the complexities of 230 uh, particularly were lost in, you know, the recent debate over SESTA-FOSTA because it got just so emotionally heated. We, we have a hard stop at one, so I know we could go on and on about this, and it's a, it's a hot topic, but we are going to conclude there. But join me in thanking uh, the Internet Caucus for hosting this event and our panelists for, joining, for being with us today and answering the questions. If you don't mind give, giving them a hand.